it's an honor, to say the least. Um, before I start, so he, uh, Dennis mentioned that I'm an anthropologist, and it occurs to me very often when I talk to people that a lot of people do not know what that means, right? What is an anthropologist? What do we actually do? So I wanted to share a little bit of that, like what anthropology did for me. It might be different for other people. Um, but I, so how I got into this, wor uh, into this work was that I was interested in religion and spirituality. Um, and of course, and how people search for meaning, how different cultures search for meaning. And obviously, as we saw already today, a lot of indigenous religions use a lot of psychoactive plants, and that's how I got into this. Um, so the, the basic, the way I teach anthropology, the basic tenet is that uh, humans construct their world, so we are looking at how humans construct their worlds through culture, um, which means, so when I say that something is culturally constructed, I don't mean that it doesn't exist. It does exist, but people make um, construct the way they, uh, what that means basically, right? Um, so, for example, you know, we all have the same biological needs, right? But different cultures have chosen to do things differently in regards to these needs. So, it's really, I came to the conclusion that there are so many perspectives in the world um, that are equally rational once you understand their own how they work in their own context. And that's what anthropology has done for me. So especially studying non-Western perspectives through this work um, has challenged my own core cultural assumptions, right, of what is real or what is not. I mean, among other things, right? Um, so this, um, paper is based on research that I started with my dissertation field work on uh, ayahuasca tourism, as Dennis said, um, in 2002, and it's developed into this ongoing project, and now I'm working on a book on sorcery, because that's, <laughs> that's where things went, uh, which is a long story. I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, but the first thing, so I did my field work in Iquitos um, that we've heard a lot about today. Um, and the idea was, the, the question I wanted to answer was why uh, do Westerners pursue these experiences and how do they construct them in the context of tourism? Right? So, and as we've already heard, I mean, ayahuasca tourism has escalated in the last few decades, I mean, since the 90s at least, but in the last 10 years, actually right after I finished the main period of my field work, it, it kind of um, exploded basically since 2005, I would say around. Um, so this is, I mean, we are experiencing something much more amplified than what I actually spend a lot of time studying. So things are changing so rapidly that um, some of the things you might, you know, think that maybe that's not um, how things are, are today, right? So I started, I mean, I, there was a trip in 2002, but the, my main fieldwork period was from 2003, um, all the way to today. So I, what I did was I interviewed, I, I lived in Iquitos for a year and a half, um, and then there were some trips um, every other year after that. Um, so I interviewed Western participants and um, several shamans in the area of Iquitos and in, in the city and around. Um, so I asked, basically I was interested in why people do this and how do they construct it, as I said. So. The main arguments back then that I made in my dissertation and in some publications is that tourism is not an anomaly, that, that shamanism is a dynamic phenomenon, because there was a lot of criticism right when I was writing this um, by some scholars criticizing um, Western engagement with these things. Um, and what, the more I read the literature, and I'm actually Manuel <laughs> did a fantastic job showing us that there was intercultural exchange long before tourism, right? Obviously it was different, but this is not the first time 
there is contact between traditions, and especially shamanism. If you talk to, to shamans even, even today, they consider always knowledge acquired from other faraway you know, places or shamans more exotic and, and more powerful, right? Even, even they consider some, some groups that whites have a lot of power that they want to, to acquire. So that is not you know, problematic per se. Um, of course, what is problematic is that you know, power differences between the West and, and places like um, zones like the Amazon. Um, but I found that there is a two-way intercultural exchange. Right? There, there were some ideas seeping from the West into these traditions, but also a lot of ideas coming back to us. So that it was a two-way street. I also found that um, I call this shamanic tourism, actually, because it encompasses a lot more than actually going down there and drinking ayahuasca. I found that there were a lot of commonalities with pilgrimage. If you read literature on pilgrimage, um, there is a lot. The two things that people, the two reasons that people go on pil pilgrimages for are healing and personal transformation. And this is what I found that, you know, the reasons that people, Westerners, go and do this. But going back to why do I call this shamanic tourism? Because I don't like the word drug tourism because it refers to very different activities. Like um, um, sometimes even for smuggling drugs or go, going to Amsterdam to just to participate in to take drugs. That, that is not what's going on here. It was initial in the 90s. It was part of ecotourism. Um, so there were these were optional ceremonies initially that were offered, and then. Um, Fast forward to today, now there is dozens of specialized ayahuasca retreats, especially since 2005. And today we have this huge, I am sorry, I don't, I didn't note where I got this image, but if anyone knows, <laughs> I, uh, I found it they, to be very descriptive of what's going on today, the, the, the commercialization of ayahuasca and always being sold as this, this remedy that will fix everything that's wrong with our Western culture, right? Um, but I want to, um, since you know, I talked about Iquitos, I mean, but most of my work has been around there. I wanted to talk a little bit about its history, because as, as others today have pointed out, that has really shaped um, the ayahuasca tradition as we know it today, right? So we need to, to keep that in mind, that it was a, so it's, it's a contact, it has been for a long time a contact zone. It was founded by missionaries. The, the name comes from a particular ethnic group. Um, it became an important uh, port because it was um, at the beginning of the Amazon River, basically, uh, for exporting um, things and uh, goods from the jungle. And others have already mentioned the rubber boom that has really, really disrupted. I mean, the, not that there was no, again, as we heard from Manuel today, um, there was a lot of um, movement of populations before, but the rubber boom really, really disrupted the, the, the landscape, the ethnic landscape of the area. Um, it, and today the tourism is actually, since a lot of these, uh, the, the rubber, since the rubber boom collapsed, that was, actually it was a very uh, prosperous time for Iquitos, right? It had, there was a tramway, there was an opera, there was um, all this wealth that was generated on the backs of indigenous peoples and there were atrocities um, committed. So again, this, because I'm gonna talk about Amazonian worldviews and how they kind of come through in, in today's um, um, ayahuasca practices. We need to keep in mind how that landscape was shaped by this history, right? How all these, uh, this contact uh, between groups happened. Um, and, and it was also, I mean, a traumatic time. We, and, and you can see evidence of that in Iquitos. You see, you know, those um, tiled buildings with, uh, you know, tile that was brought from uh, Europe, you know, that shows the, the, the wealth that was, that existed at that time. And then, you know, you have these, um, so it's, it's kind of, again, it's a contact zone where modernity exists, coexists with these, you know, magical tales. They, this, um, the last picture there is um, an artist's rendition of the myth of, um, the, the Buffeo Colorado, the pink dolphin, that basically, the myth is that um, 
At least every, people tell a lot in the area that uh, pink dolphins turn into men and have sex with human women and you know, they give birth to pink dolphins and, and those men are white men. So I, I think that's very significant and that tells that story of the trauma and how it, you know, it's still there in the form of these stories, right? Um, and of course, you know, after uh, you walk down a few blocks from where all these nice, you know, buildings are and, you know, the people live in, you know, Iquitos attracts a lot of people from the jungle that are looking for, you know, jobs and they live in conditions where there is no running water, no electricity. Um, so there is a lot of that uh, we need to keep in mind a lot of poverty, a lot of envy if someone, that's going to be significant in a bit when I talk about um, the, the context within ayahuasca is used. Uh, but I want to talk today about the plants that are used around ayahuasca. A lot of our focus has been on the ayahuasca brew and the, you know, the, the, the vine and the chacruna and how they work together. We know more about that than about the other plants and the worldviews that go with them. And one of the things that I found really important is that how, how Amazonian conceptions of the body, right? And how they, basically the idea is that body, we tend to see bodies as this biological fact, right? They objectively, there is, it's, they're an objective biological fact. Um, in the Amazon, they don't necessarily see them that way. They are constantly made with the ingestion of certain substances, like throughout your life, you constantly construct your body through ingesting certain substances. Um, so the idea is that you, a lot of these things that we talk about are not necessarily, that I will talk about, um, are not necessarily taken to change your consciousness. So that when we use the word drugs, and you know, I looked at different definitions and most are some, some version of um, something that will change your consciousness, something like that. So a lot of the things that are used in the context that I will talk about today are not about changing your consciousness. They're about changing your body, right? So for example, and a lot of them we wouldn't consider psychoactive, right? A lot, so for example, in some, um, so the Kashinawa initiate boys into hunting uh, through a prolonged diet. So diets are not necessarily a shamanic, um, you know, something that only shamans do. Um, and they, they begin the diet with using the frog skin that was mentioned today to cleanse the body. Um, and then they, they uh, kill a boat to eat its tongue. And that is the idea is and that, you see, they don't even, they don't do this just with plants, right? To, um, to embed the body with certain qualities. So in this case, the idea is that the boa's qualities um, are transmitted to the hunter so they will be able to, to hunt larger game. So a lot of that, so I have, I mean, I will base, barely scratch the surface here, but I just wanted to give you enough examples to see that this is pretty pervasive. So, and, and perspectivism that, um, um, Luis and Eduardo Luna mentioned today is really at the center of this, in my opinion, because what um, perspectivism means is that all living beings basically have a soul, right? They're all human, or at least they were human at a, at a certain time. Um, um, so we all, yeah, we're all people, right? But what makes us different are our bodies, not our souls, right? So that makes, that makes a lot of sense then when you think of what I said with you know, embedding the body with different qualities. Um, so th that explains why the emphasis is on fabricating the body um, as opposed to something else, right? Um, Another example is for um, uh, people, in, uh, for the Naporuna, they drink. Uh, basically, they consider any uh, drunkenness in general as a way to open the body to the spirit world um, so that um, your essence is manifest. So it's not something, it's, it's something, uh, drunkenness is positive. It's, it's a way to attain knowledge. Um, and again, there is an emphasis on changing one's body over their lives, basically to, uh, especially making it uh, stronger. Um, and the, where the body's power is, is the flesh for the Naporuna. Um, Walker also 
talks about how the, uh, the um, bodies are perceived as leaky and permeable. I mean, that's why you need um, certain to ingest medicines and remedies to uh, and keep certain prohibitions to strengthen the body and make it um, and kind of to protect it from um, that original state of permeability. So when a, when a child is born, all this long process starts of making that body of strengthening it and and embedding a soul in the body. Um, so again, with the hunting, for example, the, with spear fishing in this case, actually, um, they put these, um, the bark of the, um, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, bihurata tree uh, around the forearm, um, and that leaves scars and that, you know, there is also practice, of course, that comes with it, but the, 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 the use of the, the bark is really important. Um, Descola also, when he talks about Shamanic apprenticeship, he talks about how basically the, uh, it, it means to change the ecology of the physical system of, of the person who is becoming a shaman. Um, and that takes the ascetic discipline, uh, purging, and diet. You already see a theme that we see today in, in the diets. Uh, and Kristen Hugh Jones, when she talked about the um, Barasana theory of the body, she says that they put a lot of value in the re on the regulation of exits and entrances. I will leave that to your imagination to figure out what that means. So, and the last example from the literature, and again, there's many more, there's gonna be more in the paper. Uh, Chevalier says um, that the, any healing prescriptions center around the same theme. One is that um, the person, the, the patient must refrain from cultural exchanges with other person. So if you think about contemporary dietas where, you know, sex is not allowed, there is spatial isolation and things like that. So he says the idea is to refrain from anything cultural. Um, and the same goes with food, like the, the food, the foods that are um, prohibited or anything that is cooked or valued by people. Um, but it's quite superfluous, like spices and salt and things like that, and um, alcohol and sugar. Um, so um, I'm gonna move on to how healing was perceived. So these, um, already you see that the typical Western like mind-body dichotomies do not really apply here, so it makes it a little, um, a, a little difficult for Westerners when they engage with this um, to think in those terms, right? That you're changing your body. Um, and I found that today, so when I was uh, doing my dissertation field work, this is how illness is um, perceived in curanderismo around the ketos, right? It's, it's perceived as having three dimensions, so there is already that separation, right? That physical, psychological, and spiritual. I mean, there's still the, the idea that all of this has an effect, that the psychological and the spiritual will have an effect on the body, but there is also a conceptual separation, right? A categorization there. <clears throat> um, and another I mean, thing that, so these, these are the two sides of contemporary shamanism, the way I um, found it, was the one side is the healing and the other side is a sorcery, and both have to do, I meaning the end, both happen in the body. So sorcery, um, what I mean by sorcery is like harming someone intentionally, um, and in this tradition that happens usually through the, the use of magic darts or other objects that are embedded in the in the body of the, of the victim, um, that ends up manifesting as sickness in the body. So a lot of the work that shamans do around Iquitos is really about healing sorcery. Um, there is also a lot of what I call shamanic warfare between shamans that are fighting <laughs> each other for either for power or you know, competition and things like that. Um, so a lot of what um, a lot of effort goes, even today, to fortify and protect the body from sorcery, right? So a lot of the, the dietas that happen today are to protect the body from sorcery. Um, so 
a lot of people have mentioned, and I'm glad, I mean, you already see that even though we didn't coordinate, all of us have mentioned today the importance of studying all these plants that um, either go into the ayahuasca brew, but I'm gonna argue also the plants that are used around it, you know, in the um, um, different practices. And that's just an example. Um, this is not my area. What I was interested in uh, was why people use these things um, and what's the meaning behind them? What's the rationale, right? Um, so the idea with the additives especially was that they added them to the brew to kind of embed the brew with the energetic qualities of, of, the, um, of the plant. So some of the additives that um, people I interviewed used were mapacho, which is the, the tobacco that they use in the area. And they, you see the reasons why they, they were using these plants. So the, mapacho was for strength and protection. Toe, which is the, um, Brookmansia that people mentioned uh, was added for strength. And these are minute, uh, minute quantities that are added to the brew, right? So, and that is not my area. Um, it is, I'm not sure how much of a pharmacologic effect they would have, I mean, but they were added for, like I said, for energetic, for the qualities. So ayauma is a tree that was uh, the bark uh, of which they, some people added, again, for protection. Capirona for cleansing and protection, and Chuyachaki Caspi for cleansing and healing, uh, Lupuna Blanca for protection. A lot, you see, a lot of need for protection, as I said. So another one is Punga Amarilla that was also added for protection or drawing out negative energies and spirits. Um, Remo Caspi, I was told, was to move dense or dark energies that might be in the body. Um, and white at Caspi to create purging, um, fix maybe gastrointestinal ailments and calmness and, and tranquility. Uchu Sanango for protection, again, power and strength, and Shiwanaku for healing and protection. Um, these are plants are in the literature that some people mentioned with their botanical names. The most important plant that is used um, in this tradition, in conjunction with ayahuasca is mapacho, right, which is a, the, a species of tobacco of, of the Nicotiana rustica and is considered in the area to be a very powerful spirit. Um, it's ever present in ayahuasca rituals. It's, um, it's blown on, on the brew while it's made. It's blown on any instruments that are used in the, in the ritual. It's, on the patients, on the shaman themselves, it's supposed to be a very protective uh, spirit. Some people diet it, some people don't. I mean, there is different traditions, different lineages around Iquitos. Um, and um, recently, unfortunately, there have been some deaths surrounding ayahuasca, and there is a lot of controversy about what you know exactly happened. Um, the little that I know points to probably tobacco intoxication, right? So this is one more reason that while we would need, we need to study the uh, tobacco use in this context more, because more and more people will go down and you know, have, do tobacco cleanses before ayahuasca ceremonies mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and we don't know um, how much knowledge these people have. Um, I, would recommend, I mean, the, I think that the best source on tobacco use in indigenous cultures is in Amazonia is by Johannes Wilbert, Tobacco and Shamanism in South America. And he may, I will mention some examples to see, uh, to show that I mean, the, the different ways that it was used and by how many groups. So he stressed the ritual aspect um, and obviously, in appropriate dosages, it was used as uh, a way um, to activate the, the jaguar self in the shaman in some groups. Um, so the jaguar uh, transformation. Uh, in Kampa shamanism, it was used as a hallucinogen in high doses. Um, the Machigenga word for shaman is seripigari, which is the one intoxicated, which means the one intoxicated by tobacco, which shows how important it is. Um, and 
for oh the shuar also ingested for for three reasons so there's different reasons why people will use tobacco they they use it as a universal remedy or as a prophylactic to strengthen the body like many of the plants i mentioned and and as a narcotic to induce dream, dreams um in some cases it's used in initiations to in order to experience symbolic death um the um the Ayoreo, and most of this is from um, Wilbert, actually. Uh, the Ayoreo um, use it, um, actually, the, the apprentice will drink a liter of pulverized green tobacco uh, and fall into a coma. So that's part of the initiation. Um, and if um, they survive, they become a shaman. Um, so the uh, the Shipibo will also in, ingest great quantities of tobacco water. Uh, to acquire their powers, um, and they use other. They also use other techniques like chewing, drinking, smoking, and snuffing an enema. So there is a lot of um, ways to do that. And and some of the groups that use it are like the campo that I mentioned: Hibaro, Piro, Machigenga, Shipigo, and Tucuna. Um, and all of these groups also use ayahuasca. So um, again, I think it's important to look at the entire context and the body of knowledge around. Um, ayahuasca. So today, like I said, it's used in um, in ceremonies in the way I described. But it's there's also specialists in the area that are called tabaqueros, right? The uh, that basically, and it's really interesting. You get a very different story when you talk to an ayahuasquero and a very different story when you talk to a tabaquero. So for tabaqueros, obviously, tobacco is the most um, a powerful spirit. They think um, ayahuasca shamans are very weak, um, and they, but also they acknowledge that tobacco is too powerful for some people, right? So they, um, but it, it, there is a whole tradition there of tabaqueros, right? That I think um, is also uh, would be a fruitful research avenue. Um, so another way, another. Um, aspect I want to discuss is the dietas. Like a lot of people um, who will go down to participate in, and I'm not talking about the ayahuasca diet that people have to observe before and after, right? These are um, part of the shamanic apprenticeship or a way of um, learning. They have become part of ayahuasca retreats. Um, it's a way of, um, learning directly from the plants. And as I mentioned, there is um, fasting and isolation um, for, I mean, any period of time. I mean, sometimes it could be a week, a month, or longer. Um, and some, um, so the, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what people have told me, the people I've worked with. They, they've told me that there are different reasons to diet a plant. So the, the idea is that you, at the beginning of the diet, of the dieta, you ingest a plant, um, and then you, for, and you might not, some, some people will ingest it for the first few days and then they just observe the diet or they will just ingest it the first day and they will observe the diet for the amount of time that um, the shaman has recommended and, um, they might do it for healing or to learn medicine or sorcery. I mean, there is that, um, there's all kinds of knowledge that can be accessed through that. Um, so the, the idea also is to, I mean, besides the very strict diet where you have a very bland diet that I mentioned before, where you don't have anything spicy or greasy or, um, you, you are also supposed to avoid physical activity. Basically, you need to spend a lot of time in your hammock and, and just behave like you were a sick person. Um, they even, some, sometimes they even discourage from reading or doing any intellectual activity. I was constantly, I, it, for me it was great because, because I, I was so focused and I could read so much in a day, but I was constantly being told, you need to stop that intellectual stuff. You know, you need to you know, be more introspective and things like that. Um, so you're supposed to be reflecting um, and, and learning. Um, 
So during today, during these dietas, people also drink ayahuasca maybe every other day or every few days, right? And this is like different, there is different opinions on that. Some people told me that it's dangerous to do that when you're dieting. Um, because then you're visible to sorcerers and you're more vulnerable, while when you are, if you don't take ayahuasca, you're more protected. Um, but it's, I mean, for the most part, people will routinely do that today, right? Um, a lot of, um, oh, I, meant, I, mean, I mentioned tabaqueros before. There is also uh, a tradition of ayahuasqueros paleros, like especially some of the plants I mentioned before that they put as additives, a lot of them are trees. Uh, paleros are the ones that use a lot of those um, trees. They're also consider, they also consider themselves more powerful than just plain ayahuasqueros, which is um, really interesting. But what I think the takeaway point is that there's so many traditions that are so many, a huge body of knowledge. Um, Different lineages have different rules for diets um, or different norms, or especially about what they're supposed to be eating and not. Uh, some will um, not. Some will eat certain kinds of fish and not others other kinds of fish, and that's because, um, or animals for that matter, because. For the same reason that you're taking the plants to embed their qualities in your body, um, you run the risk when you are, for example, in some lineages they will not allow uh, fish that has teeth because that would, you know, maybe transfer aggressiveness to to the person. So there is a lot of that um, ideology of uh, being very careful of who you what you consume during that time, because it's, very, it's a very risky situation. You might take on qualities that you don't want. Also, if you don't follow the diet strictly, I mean, traditionally, in all of the groups that I mentioned, you might have the opposite effect of what you're trying to achieve, right? If you don't um, follow the diet to the end, you know, you might be trying to be brave and be really, really uh, the opposite of brave if you don't do what you're supposed to do. So this is a really, um, really serious matter in, I mean, traditionally. Um, and oh, where was I? Yeah, the idea is that the, the spirits of the trees or the plants or, or whatever you are dieting will enter your body and will teach you literally from the inside out. So think that relates to what uh, was said today about perspectivism too, that you, you start seeing the world from the perspective of another, um, of another being. Um, also in the tradition that I'm most familiar with, they require that you bathe really, really early in the morning, that you immerse yourself in the cold water. In some traditions, you're supposed to bathe multiple times a day to strengthen the body. Um, Again, and if these things are broken, consequences might occur. And they might occur in the, in the next um, ceremony. You know, they might be, you might be punished from the spirits and, and things like that. Um, what, another interesting thing that I found with this is that usually people will diet one plant at a time, because right? you're learning from this one spirit and you want to um, familiarize yourself, your, yourself with, with that spirit and its qualities and all of that, but uh, there are some lineages that will actually um, allow people to diet more plants at a time. And I wonder if that is kind of a sign of, you know, this very fast capitalist society where we want to learn more fast because, you know, you're in the Amazon maybe for a, for a week and you want to make the most of it. So you, I've heard of a lot of cases where people will um, um, diet even multiple plants at a time. Others really frown upon that. They think that's not possible. It's not possible to learn properly like that because you wouldn't know which plant is, is, is doing what. Um, so there's different schools of thought to say the least, right? Um, and there's different, um, ideas about what each plant, I mean, there is, 
For example, ajo sacha is a plant that uh, um, I was told they, they diet to treat problems of general discomfort and pain, and it generates heat, heat in the body, and again, strengthens the body, gives you physical strength. Um, but I was also told that the same plant might have different effects on different people. So context, who is, who is dieting, um, and in what context also plays a role, and I think we should also be paying attention to that. Um, even clinical trials in the West, you have different results with different patients. So this is something we need to keep in mind. Um, so I, as an example, I, well, I've been working with this um, Spanish um, shaman. So he, he was trained, obviously, in the mestizo tradition with a um, uh, shaman in, in Iquitos. Um, and <clears throat> I've been working with him more than over the years um, for more time. So I know him more intimately. We're working on a book on sorcery together because it's played a huge role in his life. Um, so we talked about um, the last time I was in Peru a couple of years ago. We talked a lot about, because we did um, a diet, like we dieted uh, the Ayauma tree that's in the picture, um, whose spirit is um, perceived as a headless giant. Um, and he told me that it's taken to strengthen the body, but it also teaches sorcery, right? So I was a little concerned about that. But he said that if you, again, the same plant, it also depends on, on your intention. He said, first of all, you need to, to take things like, to diet plants like that, to know how to counter sorcery in, well, if something happens. Um, and also he said, if you, if you just want to learn how to counter sorcery, you just diet it for a shorter time, so you don't go into um, the, the dark arts, I suppose, that some people, as pe some people call them. Um, so he said that it's a good, even now that he's a practicing ayahuasquero, it's, a, it's good to do a diet um, at least once a year to cleanse uh, the body and center himself. Um, and it's, he said it's a good tool for anyone to reflect over their lives, the, any patterns that they might need to change. So you already see um, possibly a Western influence there, right? that it's used in a, in a slightly different, at least it's conceptualized a little differently. But I want to read um, <clears throat> a quote by uh, one of our conversations. Um, he said, uh, these plants have their genios, which is the spirits, basically. Uh, when, you're dieting, when you're dieting these eight days without salt, without sugar, um, as we are now, that's when we were doing a diet, uh, and you have taken the plant and the plant is in you, you're allowing that plant to develop in you. That month that you do not do certain things, that's because, I mean, even, even when you... You continue to, to have some restrictions after, like even if you do a one-week diet. Um, so you continue to have some restrictions afterwards. Um, let's say, so he says that month that you don't do certain things, um, it's the valorization that you're going to give to that plant. If you're dieting well, then the spirit of that plant will be with you. If it is to cure a disease, it will help you cure the disease. Uh, if it is in your, uh, in your hands and in God's hands to heal it. If it is to learn every time you need that plant in any caro or something to heal someone, you will have the strength and power of that medicine in you. So you see what I was talking about before, like the idea of the, that you're embedding the medicine in your body and it's with you forever as long as you keep certain restrictions. Um, so this is a, a contemporary understanding um, of diets, so he, he continues to say that there are many types of diets. There are diets for more protection, more guardians, more guardian spirits, diets that serve to heal bones, muscles, or organs, others that enhance your spirituality, others to strengthen you physically or mentally. Um, 
And he says each plant has its own, uh, has its way. Ultimately, if we focus and welcome each plant, letting it take us to what the medicine gives us, I believe that the same plant can give a person one thing from another. That's why I do not focus so much on what the plant is for, because I have seen that the same plant, which is being eaten by the same people, doing the same thing, eating the same thing, doing the same ayahuasca ceremonies, to some people it brings certain things and to others something different. Uh, but ultimately, the purpose of the diets of diets is to heal for um, uh, most people. Uh, but he also learned uh, when he spent time in the jungle with and then exchanging knowledge with uh, you know other ayahuasqueros or tabaqueros or you know there's even today an exchange of knowledge uh, between shamans that respect each other and consider you know um, the other an ally. Um, so he found out from them that um, sorcerers, uh, sorcerers will diet certain plants to learn sorcery. Um, but again, like I said, it's good. So, he, but he will still try, especially in light some, of some recent events, that, that he tries to diet some of these plants in order to counteract sorcery um, or and protect um, him, himself, basically. Um, and he found out from, from these other ayahuasca or some tabaqueros in the area actually that if he diets these plants for a shorter time, he will learn how to protect himself but not go into these, you know, other areas that he doesn't want to. Um, so, and he did, there was a time in his life where, actually several times, but before, uh, months before, you know, the, this uh, diet that we did, he did almost die, there, he had a very hard, uh, time and that he at attributes to sorcery attacks. Um, and he did do a strict, a, a, a very strong um, tobacco diet um, and accompanied with um, ritual baths with uh, this plant that you probably know as elephant's ear. It's called patikina in, in the area. Um, so he did um, this bath so he dieted tobacco and at the same time he, he had this ritual bath with uh, patikina or um, toe and some tobacco in the, in the bath too. And that is again to strengthen and protect the body. Um, and he actually says that after this, um, he did feel stronger, safer and protected. And when he was attacked during ceremonies, he um, I mean, he was still being attacked, but he was able to counter those attacks without um, putting himself into danger. Um, so when we actually dieted the ayauma that I showed you before, this is still the bath, um, it was because at that, that was in 2013, there was a, a string of attacks that happened during ceremonies. And I was there, and during one of them, he actually fell on the ground. He didn't have the physical strength to actually continue the ceremony. Uh, he was in physical pain. Um, so, the, and there was a lot of that going on. That was the most uh, severe one. Um, so he was told, and he remembered from his teacher that ayauma is a good plant to diet. And since I was working with him, um, and I was perceiving what was going on in the ceremony, he thought I needed to diet that as well. So that's how we got to both of us dieting the ayauma. And the part of the diet was also, so we drank, um, he put the, the bark of the tree in water and we drank that water in the, the next morning. Um, we also had to bathe with the fruit of the plant that you saw here, like you pop it open. It has a, actually a very interesting scent and we rubbed our bodies with that so for extra protection. Um, so uh, on top of that, of the attacks that he was having that year when I arrived in Iquitos, like within, and that's when we had already decided that we're consciously working on this project together, writing a book. Um, he's, he felt that the attacks were because um, people didn't, or certain people didn't want us to do this project. Um, so I, I got sick immediately after arrival to Iquitos and I didn't know what was going on. So I think, oh, I had diarrhea at first and then 
I think I got dehydrated so much from it that I got a bladder infection, but I didn't realize until uh, my body was shutting down and he took me to the hospital and they figured it out um, and gave me massive amounts of antibiotics. But he interpreted all of this, having all these obstacles as you know, the result of sorcery and we had to fortify ourselves through this diet. Um, he also gave me kamalonga, which is another um, plant um, to heal myself because of my ordeal. Um, and yeah, we had, like I said, during that diet, we had a lot of discussions about what diets mean and he, what healing means. And his advice for me was that to focus on, on the illness and see if the, you know, what's the reason for it, what, um, to meditate and think about it and ask the illness why, um, why it's there, um, what gift are you bringing me and things like that. So, and he was talking about um, maybe going at the root of the illness um, that he could perceived that was not physical, right? Um, so he also saw dieting as an exercise in his own power, like being able to discipline yourself for certain amounts of time. That was an exercise in, in his own power. Um, and I will finish with, yeah, the, the, my next visit that was in 2015 was when um, another misfortune happened to me the minute I, almost the minute I, so the night before we were supposed to go to the jungle to diet uh, and take ayahuasca, my, pass, my purse with my pass passport was stolen, uh, which was devastating because I couldn't leave the country, I couldn't go back to the States, right? Um, and of course it was immediately, I mean, I had to go to Lima and do the paperwork and then came back while waiting for my passport to come from Greece. But um, it was immediately between him and this other, this is a tabaquero that he, you know, they're supporting each other basically. Um, they were both really concerned that this was all, you know, their shamanic intervention was needed. So they, I had to go through the same. Well, I didn't, I didn't diet tobacco because I think he also agreed that this, it's too strong for me that I should, it's, I should probably not do it. But they did the whole, so what they had me do was take ohe, which is the resin of, of another plant that is taken for um, cleansing. It's really, really brutal. Um, you take it in the morning, it's kind of like this, milky sap that doesn't taste bad, but then you have to drink massive amounts of water, so you vomit and, you know, you remember the exits and entrances. So, and that is basically a whole day ordeal that they felt, you know, I had to do to cleanse myself, to fortify myself, and be protected from things like that in the future. And, and of course, I did the ritual bath with the patikina. Actually, the patikina is, um, when I mentioned this to my friends in Iquitos when I went back, they, they said, oh yeah, but everybody knows the patikina is a protective plant. Like you have it, um, you can have it next to your door and that will deflect, you know, certain things. So, Hopefully that worked, we'll see. So far, so good. Uh, but Ohe, to, to finish with that, Ohe is mentioned in the literature. Uh, Louis has mentioned it too as a powerful plant teacher. And um, it, sometimes it's used to, of course, get rid of parasites and things. But the, these guys have, are using it to, basically what he told me was that you, you know, after this you're gonna feel like new, you're gonna shine, you're gonna be, you know, basically, a new person. Um, so, in I'm gonna, I've been speaking for f at least 45 minutes, so I'm gonna make this, cut this short. Um, so according to Stephen Hugh Jones, um, an anthropology, what he calls it, an anthropology of peculiar substances, which is what, I think it's a nice way to talk about what we're doing here. Um, might usefully begin by thinking more about the consumption of stimulants or psychoactive substances in relation to the consumption of more ordinary fare. 
So he suggests on um, focusing on ethnographic, he suggests focusing on ethnographic evidence on behavior and social interaction and a more cultural approach uh, focusing on categorization. Um, in this case, so even though the, a lot of the plants I mentioned are not considered um, psychoactive, um, some of them are used in that sense in, in this context. Um, or at least they could teach us a lot about Amazonian worldview that I feel what I found over the years is that a lot of that gets lost in translation. A, lo a lot of our focus is on healing and personal transformation and uh, there is a lot of lessons we're missing from Amazonian worldview that I think can be really valuable, especially the, the, all the stuff about the body that I talked about. So it's important to, so basically, what I'm saying is that it's important to study the context uh, of these things, all these, uh, all the things that come, that the worldviews and the the ideologies that come with it. Um, look at all this. Uh, also look at all these different specialists. That uh, there's a lot of knowledge speciali specialization in the Amazon. Um, the different types of plants they use. Uh, like the, at least the tabaqueros and the paleros are pretty widespread in, um, in Iquitos. Um, so basically we need to look at these things more holistically um, and from the perspective of the practitioners as well as the patients. Um, and, um, so, and like I said, not only do they use a variety of interventions like the, the baths and the cleanses and all these other things, um, there is, I mean, there is probably a lot of knowledge because of that focus on ayahuasca right now that might be lost in, in the future. So I think we should, uh, like others have said today, I'm gonna amplify that we need to focus more on these other, um, studying uh, these other plants within their context, obviously, um, and especially understanding uh, local conceptions of the body and to, to understand how these modalities um, work. Um, so I think this, especially the, this forum, I mean, this symposium is a great, great opportunity for that interdisciplinary, inter, interdisciplinary dialogue to start. Um, not that it's not happening, but I think we can, we can do more of that. And of course, as I mentioned, we need to um, study more of the risks. Um, associated with using some of these things. Because um, a, a lot of what I've seen with some of the deaths that have happened over the last few years is that um, a lot of people keep, the conversation stops at ayahuasca is very safe and there is no way, there is no risk. Um, but there's all these other things that are used in conjunction with ayahuasca that I have a good, good reason to believe that might be responsible or contributing to these deaths, so we need to study those as well. So that was that was my talk. Thank you. Thank you.